The exhibition takes its title from Cast But One Shadow, a novel by Han Suing that was first published in 1962. The story is, is of a French girl, Sovi, who was adopted by a Khmer woman after her parents are killed during the Japanese occupation and is later caught between being French and Khmer. While a fiction Han Suing's story was modeled on the real story of Maria Bertha Hertog, who was also known as Nadra Adipi. Nadra was a Dutch Eurasian who had been left with a Malay woman when her parents were captured as POWs. Nadra was raised as a Malay Muslim speaking only Malay and practicing Islam. After the war in early 1950, her biological parents sought to reclaim her. On 1st August 1950, she married Mansur Adabi, a teacher in Singapore. Upon learning of the marriage, the Hertogs would press their claim for their daughter through the Dutch government, creating a diplomatic issue with the British colonial government in Malaya at the time. Over time, the issue would garner international attention and be framed as competition between the legitimacy of a Muslim or Western worldview. Despite their efforts and support from across the Islamic world, the court case in Singapore would overturn the marriage and assign custody of Nadra to the Hertogs. Nadra would become Maria and return to the Netherlands. Convinced that the colonial legal system had a bias against Muslims, the judgment from the case would incite a riot. 18 people would be killed and 173 injured as a mob of mostly Muslims targeted Euro Europeans and Eurasians on the streets of Singapore. The violence would be important internationally and the riot would become one of the often cited examples to justify the importance of Singapore's religious and racial harmony policies. More than the enduring importance of the imagination of the enduring, uh, uh, more than the enduring importance of the imagination of the riots upon governance in Singapore, the case and the riots were an important historical linchpin for a regional imagination of decolonial camaraderie. One that will color the years from 1952 to 1964 when Han Suing lived in Malaya. These issues would also inspire the novella that this exhibition is named after. The period of 1952 to 1964 marked Han Suing's ascension as an internationally recognized writer, a glamour girl whose way of life would be emulated and celebrated in popular culture in Malaya, and she would be lauded as a representative of an Afro-Asian voice. Her fame would follow from her novel A Many Splendor Thing that was published in 1952 and was later in 1955 made into the Hollywood blockbuster Love is a Many Splendor Thing, a poster um, of which can be found in the gallery. Her time in Malaya was also a period of time in her writing when she wrote a, with a regional consciousness using her fiction and and her intracidal position as Eurasian as a means to pick at the complex geopolitical entanglements that entwined regional and global imaginations of race and decolonization in Southeast Asia. Her stories were often thinly veiled versions of her own life and her own perceptions of the world she lived in. The books she wrote in Malaya were perhaps the most faithful of her fictions to her life and in many ways some of the most political in their ardent attempts at arguing for alternative perspectives of the day and her own attempts at intervening into the geopolitics of the time. It is important to note though that while she lived in Malaya, she, would, she was practicing as a physician. The archival collection of material collected in this room of the exhibition of um, Cast But One Shadow speaks not to her career as a physician um, but specifically speaks to the writing that she did while living in Malaya. They include a photograph of her by Ernest Hans, uh, which speaks to her support of Nanyang painters in Singapore, a painting um, in the background, a faint outline of the painting in the background seems to evidence this, her adoption of kittens, but also her celebrity. After all, the photograph was probably taken for a magazine feature. Um, there, is, um, there is something ironic to this photo as well. It, it would definitely be a photo that would be well, seems well placed for the internet today um, with the internet sort of obsession of attractive women and kittens. 
Um, well, accompanying this photograph is a reproduction of pages from Hill World magazine, a women's magazine that launched in 1960 and which in its early issues gave her a feature. The feature really focused on the building of her house in Johor. Um, and what was interesting about her house was that it was built by the architect Ki Yip um, and that it was inspired by what Ki Yip described as the Malay house, um, drawing up allusions to sort of kampong houses on stilts. Um, he believed that tropical modern architecture was a way of reorientating architecture's cultural references away from Western metropoles. The house the magazine declares is an ideal for a Malaya, Malaya of the future. In many ways, the, the life that Han Suing lived in Malaya was one that supported the production of um, culture, cultural, um, cultural objects, houses, or so forth, of a post-colonial or decolonial nature. She, in effect, put her money, um, put put her money behind her ideas, and supported um, Malayan artists, architects, and cultural producers. Alongside um, these images that are related to her life, are book jackets of the novels she wrote while living in Malaya. The book, The Rain My Drink, 1956 was a fictive account of the Malayan emergency that supposedly damaged the career of her second husband, Leon Combo, who was a special branch officer. The Mountain is Young is supposedly one of the only historical accounts of the corona uh, coronation of the Nepalese king and queen in May 1956. The introduction of the Four Faces, written in 1963, was an account situated in a writer's conference in Cambodia. The introduction of that book would go so far as to claim that Han hid truth in fiction. In a sense, Han Suing's work and its underlying historical truth, cloaked in fictions, speak to the undertones of this exhibition and function as an ancestor to the artistic practices in the exhibition. Her works are a foil, for example, to Sim Chinese practice, which mined the British archives for the unspoken and unvisualized histories and perspectives of the Malayan emergency. As a Eurasian woman and part of a larger Chinese diaspora during the Cold War, Han Suing offers up historical context for Claire's work in this, this section of the exhibition. Furthermore, Fan, Han's soft diplomacy through fiction juxtaposes the collection of material on Imelda Marcos in China in this room, speaking to the myriad of geopolitical speech acts that define this era. Hi, I'm Chi Yin. I'm a photographer um, from Singapore. I'm currently based in Berlin. Um, so I have two works in this show um, curated by Kathleen and Carlos, and um, they are from a series of work called Interventions, um, titled such for the multiple meanings of that word interventions. Obviously, this um, work is about the British intervention into Malaya um, at the time of the um, the Cold War, so um, during the Malayan emergency between 1948 and 1960. Um, and they are also my interventions in the colonial representation of this war and its combatants. Um, this series, Interventions, was made between 2018 and 2020 and essentially involves my going into the British archives, primarily the Imperial War Museum archive in the United Kingdom, and looking at all the photographs in the collection on Malaya. And uh, I made a selection of the prints I found interesting, prints and negatives I found interesting, and I photographed them um, against a very strong backlight, such that the um, verso and recto merged into one plane in camera. So what you see might resemble collages, but they're in fact um, made in single shots in camera. That there's no um, photoshopping, post-production, or collaging. Um, so the the idea is that there's this kind of seepage across materiality and time in this project. And the um, scribblings on the backs of the prints, um, the different 
captions that were written, either typewritten on pieces of paper or handwritten in pencil or different colored wax pencils, often either blue or red, on the backs of the, of the archival prints. Um, they seep across to the front and in photographing them um, from the front, I um, create this sort of illegibility because um, the text becomes reversed and it's there and you can read it perhaps a little bit, but it's it's not entirely legible. So I'm really trying to work with these ideas of legibility and illegibility and um, in, in the colonial archive and in the colonial representation. Um, I also was quite interested in the uh, running index numbers on the backs of the prints written again in different colored wax pencils. Um, and uh, part of my intention with this work is to sort of reveal the layers of indexing and indexicality in the colonial archive. You know, what goes into an archive, uh, what images come to define um, the history writing, history making, and, the, and in turn the public memory around this war. Um, you know, archives are key in knowledge production and, and thus I was quite interested in trying to reveal the layers of indexing that, that go on in a colonial archive um, around a war like this one. This is just one case study, but obviously um, all wars and all conflicts go, you know, recorded in some kind of a archive in this kind of manner. Someone makes a decision about what to include and what to exclude and what running numbers to put on them. In this, uh, in these two works that you that are shown in in this show, um, one is uh, of uh, the colonial forces uh, landing in parachutes um, over the jungles of Malaya. Um, it's quite a, an important and iconic image in my mind because obviously the jungle was a, a key part of this war. It was almost as if the jungle itself was a character in, in this, this conflict. And um, so there's this idea of the terrain and the, the territory and, and you can see the words written in blue wax pencil um, across the picture and in, in illuminating the, the prints from behind, I was quite intrigued by sort of um, just on the aesthetic level, you know, um, the kind of new compositions that emerged, um, the new scenes that emerged, um, the the way the words interplay with the human figures, which are small and obscure but present in the print, um, is quite interesting to me. The second print you have in the show is. Um, one of the most important, I think, pictures that I've come across in this archive. Um, there are very few representations of the so-called enemy in this archive. And um, I think of the thousands of archival pictures I looked at, probably there were fewer than a dozen that showed um, the brown and yellow uh, bodies that fought against the colonial forces in this war. And this particular one is, um, I think, the most striking in my mind. Um, it shows four captured guerrilla fighters seated on what looks like a sort of kampong house, uh, probably a police station. And um, they are in sort of a posture of subjugation, but there's also a kind of defiance in, in their bodies and in their eyes, definitely. So um, there's a lot in this photograph, which, I mean, the original photograph itself is an amazing photograph and there are layers of um, things that interest me in this print uh, which I photographed which I re-photographed um, one of which is the um, black outline marks on some of the bodies and um, collars and um, knees and if you look closely you can see a sort of black pencil outline this suggests that this print was circulated to the press at the time um, so probably in the early 50s, it was circulated to the press. Um, the pictures in this archive served two main purposes. One was propaganda, and the second was military intelligence. So in this case, this print was probably circulated for propaganda purposes. So, you know, announcing the capture of the so-called bandits in, in this war. Um, if you read um, the back of this print, or if you read the, 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 the big letters that are spread in reverse across the top of the print, um, you can see the word bandits and uh, that's written quite prominently in blue wax pencil on the back of the print. 
and there's a bit of a outline, faint outline of a, a, a pencil in caption on the back as well. Um, so yeah, so this print really uh, was, you know, a way for me to get into opening up, opening up reflections uh, around the circulation of these images as well. So you know, um, what what work they did after they were uh, made. You know, these pictures. What what work did they do in this war? So this this picture is quite clearly you know something that was circulated in the press at the time and then obviously it entered into some kind of a, a military archive and it ended up in the Imperial War Museum archive and uh, now I've kind of I suppose reactivated it and you know made it something else and circulate and, and I'm circulating it in this new way so I think we should also you know think about the, the circulation of these images um, I went into this archive trying to find representations of the anti-colonial fighters because that's my main interest to re-narrate this war from that perspective which has been muted or erased pretty much um, in the usual telling of the story but um, of course I was to, to be disappointed because this ultimately is the British military um, photographic archive so most of the photographs celebrated the triumphant white body um, smashing the local insurgents and so that's that's not so surprising in a way but um, still I I was um, yeah I was trying to find more representations of, of these brown and yellow bodies and uh, this particular image was was a striking one so these two images come from a wider body of pictures um, from this intervention's work and intervention itself is a part of a multi-chapter, multi-year project that I've been doing on the Malayan emergency. Um, there are three main chapters in this work. One is interventions, and the second is uh, a chapter called remnants, which deals with the landscapes which are informal sites of memory around this war. Um, and a third chapter is called Requiem, which is a two-channel video and sound installation of songs from, from this war. Um, and and my starting point in looking at the Malayan emergency was um, from family history. I had a grandfather, uh, my paternal grandfather was involved in this war as a journalist and intellectual. And he was deported by the British um, quite early on in 1949 and was executed um, a shortly after arri arriving in China by the nationalists because China at the time was still in a state of civil war and the communists had not uh, won yet. So he was basically um, among 30 to 40,000 people who were deported um, by the British uh, to mostly to China because of the ethnicity. They were ethnic Chinese and therefore they were deported to China. And um, he was uh, unlucky to be among the first waves of deportees and therefore um, I suppose, you know, if you send people back in a time of civil war, there's a very high chance that they'll be executed because they arrive as communists of a fraternal party, um, the Malayan Communist Party. Um, so, so that was my entry point and I've been building out this project to encompass multiple chapters and Interventions is the latest of these chapters, and um, it, yeah, it examines the colonial representation and it tries to deconstruct, I suppose, you know, what goes into an archive and and uh, tries to um, get us to relook and reflect on on these images that have come to define what we know about this conflict. <laughs> 